We've all heard about the M1 MacBook, the new silicon arm based chip, the revolutionary performance, the fact that it can edit practically anything. My feed has been flooded with videos talking about how good it is for editing and how people are throwing out their old, more expensive, higher spec computers to switch to the M1. But how good is it really for editing? I'm not just talking clips and YouTube videos, but actual long form narrative projects, large project editing, stacked timelines with a lot going on. And can it really cut high resolution B-RAW footage? No. But the answer is a little more complex than that. Hello everybody, my name is Guy Pigden, I am the Savage Filmmaker. I make feature films, web series and shorts, and I'm here to give tips and advice to indie filmmakers about how to make those things. I purchased my M1 to replace my MacBook Pro 15-inch 2018 for mobile editing. A solid laptop in its own right, but one definitely starting to show its age. I didn't necessarily think the M1 was going to be my main editing computer, but after some unfortunate experiences with my specced out desktop PC, which I'll talk about in another video, this is exactly what happened. I brought the best M1 MacBook Pro 13 inch with 16 gigs of RAM and an 8 core CPU. So let's start with the pros of the M1 MacBook Pro. Allow myself to introduce myself. The M1 is quick and snappy when it comes to using most programs. For general use, it is incredibly fast. I'm the type of person that likes to flick back and forth between programs constantly. I might have Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, DaVinci Resolve and Chrome open with 40 tabs all at once. The M1 handles all of this effortlessly, with very rarely any issue which is more than I can say for much higher spec desktops. The battery life is absolutely superb and it does run very quiet most of the time. Although the idea that it runs silently is definitely an exaggeration. The M1 was quiet, they said. The fans barely kick in, they said. You'll never even hear it, they said. Let's just have a listen to the M1 and its silent running fans that are always running silently, very silent. Only silent when not rendering. In terms of editing, I do most of my work in Premiere or Resolve. While Premiere is not optimized yet for M1 silicon systems, the newest version still runs through Rosetta pretty well. Working on big projects, I rarely encountered any crashes, and DaVinci Resolve being more optimized is even more stable. You can definitely edit off this machine and it can handle 4 and 6K footage to a point. But I think your experience with the M1 will greatly depend what computer you're coming from. It easily bests my 2018 MacBook Pro 15 inch in every area. So if you're coming from something like that, you'll notice a huge difference. And I found out for a lot of things, it actually ran smoother and at times quicker than my desktop PC, a Ryzen 3950 64 gig with a 2080 Ti graphics card. But comparing my M1 to the newest model 16 inch Intel MacBook Pro with the best graphics card, it was still quite far behind in terms of editing performance. I think the problem with M1 is our expectations around it. We've all seen the videos online showing people dropping high resolution clips into a timeline and then watching them play back smoothly. But these tests often don't really take into account for editing real projects. An edit is not one or two clips in a timeline. It's a large sequence of clips, often with many layers, graphical adjustments, color correction, titles, sound design, all overlapping each other. And when you start to introduce these elements collectively to an editing project, the M1 starts to falter. Firstly, the ports and connectivity. The M1 MacBook only has two Thunderbolt ports for connecting peripherals. This just is not enough, period. Editing on a 13 inch screen for long periods of time is just not practical. So you're gonna need a monitor. So you connect a monitor via one port and your mains power to the other. Great, 
What about plugging in an external hard drive for all the footage you want to edit? Plug in that hard drive, now you have to unplug your monitor or your power. The solution is purchasing a Thunderbolt dock separately. The new OWC Thunderbolt dock offers the extra connectivity you need, but also costs an extra $250. And there's no sensible way to edit projects comfortably without it. Factor that into your purchasing cost. Also, due to the limitation with the new Silicon Arm M1 chips, the M1 MacBook only supports one monitor. Another problem for editors who like to work off two. Fortunately, there is a workaround using Display Link Manager program and connecting a USB to HDMI cable from the OWC dock to a second monitor. This is the method I use and it works pretty well, although you will not get full resolution from the second display monitor. It's just another frustration that goes back to the M1's lack of ports. If the M1 chips can't do more than two Thunderbolt ports, they should have added some USB ports to balance things out. Question. How do you brick a Mac M1 Pro? Answer. You just plug a dongle into it. Okay, so I'm just going to plug this into the side here. There we go. One of the most common is the purple screen of death. We all remember the red ring of death from the Xbox 360, or at least I do. The M1 screen will flash purple for a second and then restart. This is often triggered when plugging something new into the M1. Some type of extra connection to a dock or dongle will trigger this restart, but I've also had it happen without plugging anything new into it. This is a widely reported problem. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no concrete solution. I might have this happen once every few days to me. Sometimes it'll be over a week before it occurs again. Once restarted, the computer will run completely normally. I think this is more a reflection of teething problems integrating the new Silicon Arm M1 chips into existing Intel-based software and hardware. The second, much more concerning bug I've discovered is the H.264 bug which I've found has not been very widely reported. I first discovered this bug when trying to export my full review of the Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro, which is over half an hour long and has quite a lot going on in it. I found that watching the export back every now and again, the compression quality would drop dramatically and become super pixelated. It didn't matter how many times I exported it, playing with different compression settings, if I exported an H.264, I would get the same pixelated compression artifacting in certain areas of my video. Originally, I put this down to Adobe Premiere, which is notoriously buggy, but after sending the edit to DaVinci Resolve, I encountered exactly the same problem. Weird, low-res quality dips at exactly the same points of my timeline. I must have exported that video over 10 times, different settings, different programs, restarting my computer, etc, etc. Every single time I got the same issue. The only workaround I found to fix the issue was to export the edit as a ProRes file. As soon as I changed the format, the issue was gone. H.264 is not just the go-to codec for YouTube videos, it's also my go-to for many clients' final outputs. If you can't trust your H.264 exports to maintain the specified quality, you have a pretty huge problem on your hands. It's also important to note, I'm not the only one who has experienced this problem, as discussed in MonkeyPixel's review of the M1, link in the description. But how is it to really edit with? I mean, really edit. Most recently, I've been editing a documentary which was approximately one hour long. This documentary was shot in HD and edited in Premiere Pro. It's a combination of C300 MXF footage and Sony's notoriously difficult HVEC codec shot on the A6500, along with stock footage and photographs. What I found was the M1 did struggle with this content. The timeline frequently stuttered when playing back at even a quarter resolution, and more annoyingly, I would also find that the audio would cut in and out sporadically when playing back clips in the timeline. I also found that after long edit sessions, the whole program would start to lag and slow down, getting progressively more choppy and stuttery as I edited. 
it reminded me of the old 16-bit Super Nintendo when there was too much going on in the screen and everything just went to shit. Well, that's what the M1 does. You can normally fix the problem with a restart, but it is very disruptive to the flow of your edit. Moving up to higher resolution footage, I recently edited a short film in B-RAW, 4.6K and 4K, shooting on the Ursa Mini Pro G1 and the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. What I found is that the M1 could play back and edit the 4K footage very well most of the time, especially if you only played it back at a quarter resolution. In fact, I felt this edit ran better than my documentary, but perhaps it's because it's shorter and the fact that I wasn't mixing codecs. But so far, I've found that any edit that starts getting past the 20 plus minutes range also starts to encounter problems. As we all know, Premiere is not currently optimized for the Mac M1. DaVinci Resolve 17, meanwhile, is. So how does high resolution footage play in Resolve? Well, editing B-RAW 6K in Resolve is normally no problem, and you can quite happily put together edits, add grading to shorts, and render everything out pretty smoothly, which is great, but only in 1080 HD timelines. This seems to be the M1's limit. As soon as you switch the timeline to UHD or above, the timeline can barely play back at all. It'll start and stop, lag, freeze, and generally not be a good time. You must edit in the 1080 timeline and only switch back to full resolution when you get to the final export stage. Moving over to the Canon C200, the M1 handles the 4K MP4 files no problem, but for some reason it can't play back the 4K HEVC codec at all. Uh, I mean not even one single clip will play back smoothly. If you decide to use Canon RAW Lite, even in a 1080 timeline you'll find this annoying habit where when playing a clip it will start off very laggy and jerky, dropping frames, and then will slowly catch back up to normal playback speed by the end of the clip. Move to a different part of the timeline and the process will repeat. This means it's not really possible to edit raw light C200 footage without first converting it to ProRes. In Premiere, the playback of raw light even at 1 quarter or 1 eighth resolution is even worse than in Resolve. Color graded exports from DaVinci Resolve are normally pretty quick, but if you're stabilizing a lot of footage or adding noise reduction, those export times can start becoming a lot slower. However, I think my review is ignoring two things. The first is the use of proxies. If you don't know what proxies are, they are simply lower quality copies of your raw footage. Lower quality copies are easy for your computer and editing software to handle, thus negating the large resolution file format problems. You make these at the start of your edit, use them for a smooth, flawless edit, then once the edit is complete, you connect back to the larger raw footage and export out the final, full quality version. Every single TV show or movie you've probably watched has used proxies in the edit. Every major editor would recommend using proxies. One of my friends who was a post VFX supervisor on the new Lord of the Rings TV series has told me time and time again to use proxies on big projects. Look, if it's good enough for Gandalf, mm. it's good enough for you. If you create proxies for every one of your projects, then most of the problems I've listed with the M1 won't bother you at all apart from maybe that H.264 bug. The second great equalizer is Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro is designed by Mac to edit on a Mac. It is the most optimized piece of software for the M1 chip. Many of the people who champion the M1 for editing also edit in Final Cut Pro. I left the Final Cut Pro ecosystem after Final Cut 7 was abandoned for Final Cut 10. It's entirely possible that Final Cut Pro and an M1 Mac are the perfect combination far more in sync than even the M1 and Resolve. So if you're a Final Cut user, perhaps the problems I've found will not affect you at all. Then again, perhaps as an edit software, Final Cut Pro still fucking sucks. If we're looking at the M1 purely as an editing machine, it feels like at least for high resolution footage, it actually has a lot of problems. I would say that I have gotten by using this as my primary editor, but at times it has been a painful process and one I don't recommend. The H.264 bug is actually very serious and has greatly affected the way I've had to finish my projects, and I'm not sure how widespread this problem is. 
As a serious editor, I'm constantly running up against the M1's limitations, and if you have a camera with raw filming options, this computer will struggle. Throw in the lack of ports, and you realise that as much as you'd like it to be as good as the YouTube videos make it out to be, the M1 Max still have some way to go before being a serious editing tool. But it was only a few years ago I was editing off a 2008 Cheese Grater Mac. We can't all afford a super desktop system. For a beginner editor or someone on a budget, the M1 is the perfect starter system for someone who can't splash out on a more expensive setup. If you're someone who is happy to incorporate proxies into your workflow, the M1 will also serve you very well. At the end of the day, price to performance ratio is still excellent. Maybe one of the first Macs that you can say truly offers insanely good value for money. If you think you fall into that category, I would recommend buying the M1 Mac Mini version. It's cheaper, it provides an HDMI port and two extra USB ports, and is just as powerful as the MacBook version. Or if you'd like a screen, you could try the new 24 inch iMac. Same performance, but featuring the 24 inch 4K monitor and two extra USB C ports. I would also suggest waiting until Apple announcements in June before making any purchase, as this is when the M2 chip and new silicon arm based models will likely be announced. The rumours suggest this new M2 chip being perhaps close to twice as good as the current M1 version. If that's true, these new models will be perfect for an editor, but for serious editing professionals, people doing long form content and those of us trying to edit in a hurry without proxies, buying an M1 Mac as your main editing computer is not a good solution. Turn back Sarah, turn back before it's too late. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. And if you'd like to support this channel, check out the link in the description to watch my new feature film Older, available free on Amazon Prime and Tubi. If you dig it, maybe consider giving it a review. Got a question about editing on the MacBook M1? Chuck it in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. As always, I am the Savage Filmmaker and I'll catch you on the next one.